We're in Ephesians chapter 6. And this is all still connected to previous verses in, in uh, well, the whole book obviously is connected together. But we can take this back to uh, verse 15 of chapter 5 where Paul says, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the, uh, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what, will the, or what the will of the Lord is. And he gives us some particular instruction about our conduct. And, and the whole book has been about who we are in Jesus and what he did for us and how he called us. And then our own interaction with him. And then the unity of the church. And then uh, a, a, a statement of kind of blanket submission. Everybody be willing to submit. Because it's in, in submitting to one another, we're setting the example for those around us of submitting to to Jesus, and then more specifically in the relationships, relationships between a, a husband and a wife, between parents and kids, we looked at last week, and we're going to start off this week with the with the bond servants and masters, and probably for our culture and our time, it would be more appropriate for us to to look at it as a, a employee employer, and maybe even at the kid level, more like school teacher and and student, even. Uh, just because of the, the authority that is given in those positions and, and the, the respect of authority, but also the respect from authority to those that are under them. So verse 5 says, Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, uh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Now, according to the flesh is important because you're talking about being interactive in the world system now. You're not just talking about in the church proper, you're talking about being out in public. You know, you you might have in this day, you might have a master that wasn't a believer, and you're a believer. You might also have a a slave who, or anyways, vice versa, it could be the other way around. Now, a slave who's not a believer, but a master is a believer. So we need to keep those things in mind here. And some people would say, why didn't Paul just come straight out and condemn slavery? Because he doesn't. He's telling them how to interact with one another. He's not, he's not condemning this right now. But you're going to see in, in this instruction, keep this in mind, Christianity really is the reason that slavery system in Rome and in any world culture where Christianity becomes the major influence in that culture, it ultimately destroys slavery just in its existence. And, and this instruction we're going to see here is going to be why. All right? So... Be obedient to, to your masters, according to the flesh, uh, with fear and trembling. So great honor, great respect, in sincerity of heart as to Christ. There's your fear and trembling. Not, not only that you want to honor your master, but because you want to honor, ultimately, Jesus. The, the, nothing in our life, if we haven't got this point already in this book, has anything to do with gaining honor and glory to ourselves or particularly anybody else, giving it to anybody else. We deal with people with honor and respect, but not because they deserve it as much as we want to honor our Father in Heaven. Alright? We, we have... I'm not even going to get into it. I've already talked about this. When I, anyways, I'm going to let that one go. All right. Not with eye service, verse 6, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And so this is the will of God, to submit to your master, to submit to your employer, your supervisor, your boss. All right, That's the will of God for you to do that. Because you then become a witness to everybody else around you. It's amazing to me, and it's still amazing to me, that, that there are even Christian businessmen who don't want to hire Christians. Because they become entitled. You're a Christian, you have to look out for me. You have to do for me. You have to treat me better than everybody else. You have to treat me differently than everybody else. And, and there's sometimes, there, from my understanding, I'm not a Christian businessman, so I don't know. But they are the, the hardest people to get to work because they feel they're privileged under another Christian. That's sad. 
That's sad. That, that you should be able to depend on them to be your hardest working employee. That the two of you might be able to set the example for everyone else. You know? Conversely, if you have a boss who claims to be a Christian, don't focus on what he's doing. Focus on what you're supposed to be doing and what you're to do to honor Christ because we tend to see the flaws in people that we spend the most time with. Just as the, the relationships we've, al we've already dealt with, we, we see the flaws in our husbands and our wives, and sometimes we focus on that instead of focusing on our own. We see the flaws in our kids or in our parents, and we focus on that instead of focusing on our own. And we'll even take our flaws and make it their problem, or we'll take our, our problems and we'll make it their fault. Right? And, and we'll do the same thing in the work in the workplace. Our fault, our, our bad behavior, our, our bad attitude is their fault. It's their problem. They made me this way. They make it impossible for me to be a good Christian because of their rules or regulations, how they want to twist it, how they want to turn it, their policies, whatever. Well, truly, if a, if a business is making it impossible for you to be a, a good light in the place because they require you to lie and to cheat and to steal, then leave the job. But if all they're asking is you follow their appropriate business policies because it's what they've found makes them a profitable business, then follow them. If they're not against God's word, then follow them. Like I said, if they, I'm not telling you to follow anybody who's going to tell you and require you to go against God's word. Because then you are not honoring God. Now your chance to honor God is to, say, is to make the stand. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to steal. This is why the warning in 1 Corinthians to not be unequally yoked, a believer with a non-believer, even applies in business. All right, When that requirement starts to come from the other side to dishonor God, now that doesn't mean if your employer comes in and tells you, you know, put your Bible away, shut your, shut your computer down and take, quit reading the Bible you're supposed to be at work, that he's against God. He may not be a believer, but that may not be what it is. Your time there that you're getting paid for is to work for them. You know, I happen to have a job where I have a lot of time to really do not a whole lot of anything. But if I start letting things go flying out past me when I'm supposed to be a security guard because I've got my nose sticking in my Bible and studying for Sunday morning, I'm not doing my job. And I have every right in the world to say, hey, you're not doing your job with that. Don't bring it anymore. Because I'm not getting paid to study for Sunday morning. I'm getting paid to do my job. All right? You're going to have opportunities to speak to people. But that doesn't mean you take company time to go in and evangelize everybody you're with by preaching at them. Your job on company time is to do the company's job. Let that speak to them. How you conduct yourself, the way you honor your boss, even if nobody else thinks that, you sh that he deserves it. I mean, because let's face it, if you've ever been in a supervisory position, you already know not everybody thinks you deserve the position, not everybody thinks you deserve the pay, not everybody thinks you deserve the recognition, the honor, the respect. They don't all think that. There, there are new people who don't know anything about you that just new hires in that are going to be disrespectful towards you because they think, well, they deserve it, not you. And they could be on the job two days and decide that, you know, they could do it better. The reality of it is they just don't want to be there. So our conduct in this relationship, and, and we'll see, it goes both ways. Not as eye service. Jesus would even teach that, right? We don't do what we do to be seen by men. If we receive our reward here for things that we do, don't expect a reward in heaven for it. You've already earned your reward. We're not to be men pleasers. We're to be 
seeking after God's will and doing what He wants us to do. Right? With good will during serv- or doing service as to the Lord, not to men. You see, the, the theme doesn't stop through this. As to Christ, the will of God. As to the Lord, not to men. Quite literally, guys, our jobs, performing our jobs in a God-honoring manner is worshiping Him. That, that's one of the ways we worship Him, is to get up, to go to work, to do the things that we're supposed to do. It, that is worshiping Him. That is honoring Him, putting Him first. And people do notice. They may not say anything right away, but they do notice. Because who do you think they're going to come to if there's a tragedy in their life and they've got nobody else to come to? You know, the, I thought when I was at a different, uh, certain time when I was in the Air Force, my, my prayer was, Lord, I don't know that I make any difference around here. I don't know if anybody even sees, am I, am I laughing at the wrong things? Am I doing the wrong things? Am I doing things or saying things that just make me look like one of the guys and not anything different? And within a couple of days, I got my answer through the mouth of another person there. was like, I don't remember how the conversation even necessarily got started, but at some point in our conversation, it was, I knew there was something different about you. I just didn't, wasn't sure what it was. Because you don't go to the parties. You don't swear. You don't do this. Your attitude's different. See, there are people that are watching. And, and, and more and more in our day and age, those things are bad to everybody. You have a good attitude. You have a great attitude. You don't complain about things. You do what you're asked. People don't like that. They, you know, they find every reason in the world to be mad at you for being like that. So what? You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for the Lord. And, and, and other times, you'll notice at work, maybe you're asked over and over again to do something. You're the one that boss comes to all the time. You already got your plate full. He's going to add one more thing to it. And you go, you're thinking, Man, Joe over here isn't already not doing half of what I do. Why are you coming to me? It's because it can depend on you. You know? There, <laughs> I heard a a pastor one time say, if you need to get something done in the church, you give it to somebody who's too busy to do it. Because they're already busy doing the stuff around the church. They're already, it's important to them. And, and to give it to somebody who's got all the time in the world is to give it to somebody who isn't given time. And, and that was, that is a popular thing in the church. That's a, and, and that's, a, again, a sad reflection in the church or in business, in our community. You know, you'll look at people who are going and going. How do you do all this stuff? How do you do this stuff and maintain a family? You know, because we, we make time in the busyness to, to be a family, too. And not only that, <clears throat> I drag the kids with me. Chances are, if you come up here and you stop in because you see my car out there, my kids are, one, at least one of them is here with me. You know, is, I'm rarely here by myself for any length of time. I may jump in and back out by myself. But if I'm up here spending any time, either there's a service going on, I'm meeting with somebody, or my kids are up here with me and, and you know, it was it Emma that said, hey, there's our other house. We, drove, we just drove past. Aren't we going to stop by the other house? We just drove when she was little bitty. Aren't we stopping at the other? Aren't we going to our other house? It's not our other house. It's the church, but you know. And that's all right. You know, we go to decorate for the women's thing. We have our kids, our grandkids, everybody's, you know. And for a time, they'll run around, be crazy about it. But, you know, they, they want to come here. They want to be here. And it has become their life, too, because it's mine. And that's Okay. It, whatever God's called you to do, whether it's business, whether it's community service some other way, working for the, the pregnancy center or, or volunteering at the hospitals or whatever, do it as under the Lord. If it's a job that pays the bills, do it as under the Lord. Knowing, verse 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Doesn't matter. Listen, if you're going out in the name of Jesus to bless people, you're going to be blessed. 
Now, uh, some of my counterparts that, that like to do the name it and claim it or the, the prosperity doctors look at this and say, see, if, if you will give us, empty out your bank account and give us the money, God will return it to you tenfold or whatever, whatever fold they decide to put on it that day. You know, it's like God runs a, a sale every once in a while. It's 75% he'll give you back. Other times it's 10%. Other times it's 10 times what you gave he's going to give you back. Whatever, whatever makes the thermometer go up. That's not what he's saying. Whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. You show love you show grace you show mercy you give honor you give respect you go out and shine the light of jesus christ be the light you're gonna get it back you're gonna feel it back if nobody else knows what you receive you know in your heart because of the satisfaction of just having jesus in your heart just the interaction that comes from being with that. Being in the service of God. The, the, the times, the days. when I mean, it's not just a good day because you're getting some benefit. But the times and the days when you do something and God blesses you for doing it. However that may be. Now, it, it could be at times. It might be monetarily. It might be, uh, you know, whatever. Whatever it might be. However he chooses to do it. But the, the greatest times of blessing is just to feel His presence and to know that He did through me. I was so willing to be His vessel at this moment. Or maybe I wasn't even so willing at the beginning of the moment. But as I started to work and operate and, and, and work for the Lord in a situation, it changes. And you do feel blessed. And you do feel you know, I've done something for my master and he's happy with me. He's pleased with me. And he's done a work in my heart because I was willing to do a work with my hands. Because I got priorities straightened around. Whatever it is. And you masters, verse 9, you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening Knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. He doesn't see you as slave and free. And see, now here's where, here's where Christianity begins to tear down the, the walls of slavery. When a, when a master looks at his slave and sees a brother. When, when a master is a Christian and a brother and, a, and a, a slave, his slave is a Christian and they see a brother. When the, when the slave looks at his master and sees a brother. And that line has to be crossed. So part of the problem in those days is now, and it would, it would go against the grain of Roman culture, now you have slaves and masters in the same church. And because in the, in the church function and in, the, in, in walking in the life of God, you walk through the door and all of a sudden, maybe the slave is an elder in the church and the master is a new believer. And now the hat changes when you walk through the door. Now it's, now in our culture, the boss and the worker walk through the door and the worker is an elder or a deacon in the church. The pastor. The pastor of the church. And, and there's now a different order. The order gets reversed. And, and because there is order in the church and because there are some men who are raised up with some authority to run the church and to, to teach and to instruct, now the hat's changed. And this is where it begins. Every time Christianity began to affect the culture, slavery began to diminish until it was destroyed. That is why some governmental systems like communism and socialism want to do away with the church. They know that happens. 
It's the first thing to do, the communists do when they take over a country is they get God out. Because they know. They know the breakdown of their system begins. And God does not see. He has no partiality. The slave is saved. The free man is saved. You know, and and again, I, you gotta. It goes both ways. This isn't predominantly a problem with those who are in authority, and this isn't predominantly a problem with those who are not in authority. It is equal on both sides. I've seen the animosity played out on both sides. I've seen jealousy played out on both sides. I've seen it all played out on both sides of this. In each position, regardless, is wrong if they think wrongly toward the other person. Or act wrongly toward the other person. Doesn't matter if it's a boss. Doesn't matter if it's a worker. A lack of respect for the other person, a lack of honor. And listen, in our culture, that's really easy to do. Because we have no respect for life in our culture. And when we have no respect for life, not for our, our unborn and not for our senior citizens, it only takes a minimal amount of time, in my opinion, before it's applied to everyone else. And that's why it doesn't matter if somebody takes a life. And we're so used to it, we're getting desensitized to the whole thing. Everybody. We're just... The unborn are not the only blobs of tissue in the minds of most people. Everybody is just a blob of tissue. And your life is not important to me, only mine is. And that's, that is anti-God. That is anti-Christ. Everybody, the Bible teaches, you look to other people, you look at other people, you treat other people as though they are better than you. As though they are more deserving of it than you are. You don't do these things to gain respect from other people. You do these things to have an open relationship with your Lord. You do these things because He's the one that's going to honor you. Not because the people you're talking to, the people you're acting toward, the people you're giving to are going to honor you. You do it because God's going to honor what you've done in His name. But if you do it to be seen, you're doing it in your own name, and there's no honor in that. Verse 10, finally, and this kind of gets to be where the Christians are, right? We, we, have, we have put up with the rest of this book to get to this couple of verses. But I'm going to tell you what, if you don't have the rest of this book, you don't know what you're talking about when you get into these verses. So if you've disregarded everything else that we've gone over in Ephesians just to get to the spiritual warfare part, then you have missed your marching orders. You've missed it. Because listen, I was thinking about this this week when I was in basic training. We weren't at war when I was in basic training, but I think last week I mentioned Gaddafi. He was the big thorn in everybody's flesh. So there was a little unrest that went on. But when you go in there, first they tell you, really, you're not worth anything. You are ours. You belong to us now. You've crossed the line. You got off the bus. You signed the paper. You raised your hand. You're ours. You're not your families, you're not your wives, you belong to the United States government. You are ours. Isn't that kind of what God says in the beginning of this book? If you have gotten on that bus, you have belonged to me now. We're an inheritance, we're valuable to him. And believe it or not, it's only a couple of days before the government starts telling me I'm valuable to the government. They start off with you're an asset. You're an asset. You, we're going to put so much money into you, you're going to work for us for four years at least. You owe us. But that's not how God sees us. He sees us as an inheritance. Right? But there's value. They see the value. And they begin to build value into you in the basic training. They begin to make you and mold you and shape the way you think, the way you talk, the way you walk. 
everything is different when you come out of basic training. You think, and you haven't even gone on to any other training, but you think you can take on the world because you're part of the United States military. That's what they do to you. You believe in a system. You have studied. You have paid attention to details that you never paid attention to before. I never once before I ever went in worried about fuzzballs on my socks. But it was important to them and it became important to me for them to not be there when an the inspection came. And there may be some things that we have addressed in this book that we never thought were really that important. Didn't really think we did it that wrong. I mean, I knew how to fold my clothes. I knew how to fold my underwear and my socks before I went in the Air Force. I just didn't know how to do it their way. I knew how to make a bed. I just didn't know how to make it their way. This is the same way with God. You know how to walk and you know how to talk. You know how to breathe. You know how to act. You still know how to do it His way. We can look around and see. We can be husbands. We can be wives. We can be fathers. We can be mothers. We can be kids. We can be whatever. But we don't know how to do it His way if we're not in His Word. And in learning these things, He's building value in us. So that we saw in the husband and wife part here in, in chapter 5. So that he can present the church to himself without spot or blemish. Having been washed in the water of his word. Now, if not every place, just about every place in the Bible where Paul or Peter addresses these relationships. Any relationships. The very next thing that comes is spiritual warfare. And that's because the way we interact with one another, even as we see here with the, with the boss and worker relationship, is the foundation of a culture. The family is the foundation. How that family interacts in the community builds on that foundation. And in the Christian life, in the Christian home, with Jesus Christ as a cornerstone, building off of Him, We can do all kinds of other things, but if we're not doing it off of Him, with Him as our priority, with Him directing our priorities, then what we do in our community, good, bad, or otherwise, doesn't matter. These first couple of verses are very important here. Verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. That's kind of like Paul saying, all these things we just talked about, you absolutely impossible for you to do them. It's impossible. It's impossible for you in your own flesh, in your own desire, to carry out anything that he's told you to do. Unless, like in chapter 5, when it says, be filled with the Spirit, now he's saying, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Walk in him. Walk with him. Let him do You can't do this on your own. Listen, they don't hand a, a bunch of guns to a group of young men, drop them off in the desert, say, here you go, go win the war. Now, man, you've got, you've got officers that are above that and officers that are above him all the way up to the president, to the people. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to, to stand against the wiles of the devil. And this is really what it's all about, to stand. And if you don't think as a believer you're going to have to stand your ground, that you're going to have to hold your position. If you think that we're going to be able to just blend in and go along with. We can't. 
We can't, but we're not going to be able to make the stands in our day. This is, this is a time like no other time has been for us in our recent history. This is a time like the early church had where lives are in danger. We're to, we're to make a stand to hold our ground is to be accused of wrongdoing, wrong thinking. This is the world we live in. You won't be able to stand under your own power. You won't. And there'll be days when you're going to be shaken to the core. There is nothing like getting the announcement. And I think part of my, I remember last week I told you guys there was a little bit of anxiety when I got our pie on, on Thursday that kind of kicked in a little bit. Like, you know, had to remind myself that it wasn't mine. My grandchild, not my child. But actually it is more than that. There's more than that, because Hope's pregnancies don't go easy. So there was fear that kicked in. And that was only a few days after the attack in Paris, with the threats of it coming here. And me and my military training seeded the vulnerability in this country. I see people not paying attention when they're out and about. I see all that. And then a couple days later, there's an attack. And it is a terrorist attack. It is associated with terrorism. It's associated with ISIS. And I had a grandbaby coming into this world. And I can freak out about that, and I can be scared about that, or I can stand in the power of the might of Jesus Christ, in his power, in his might, be ready for this. And whatever happens, pour my life into that little kid. Put on the whole armor of God. Now Paul is standing there chained to a Roman soldier while he's writing this. This is not a big deal for him. He didn't have to think about it. He didn't have to conjure anything up. He's got the model of these next four verses just standing there chained to him. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because he's coming for us. The enemy's there. And this is the accusations the wiles. This isn't some sneaky trick. He's not some sneaky snook like Lucy would call him. He's sneaky. He's tricky. But this is this is the accusation. And the Bible tells us he stands all day accusing the brethren. And in that particular phrase, it's talking about categorizing. So he didn't just say Glenn's a sinner. He's got these categories in my life. And he can pigeonhole one here, an accusation here, an accusation there. And we can do the same thing to ourselves. I'm doing all right in this part of my life. This part over here I'm struggling with a little bit. Quit categorizing your, categorizing your life. Your life is a whole life. I get you have some areas you've got to work on a little more, but it, if, you are, if you are failing failing in one area of your life you're failing you, under, you understand that see it's like the law if you broke one of the ten commandments you broke the law because the law is whole it's the law 
Right? So if, we, if we're failing in one part of our life, we got to quit you know, categorizing, saying, well, the majority of my life, the majority of areas of my life, I'm doing great. This one is a real shortcoming. I'm just going to ignore that. That's the tendency. Or put it under the blanket of everything else. Listen, if I'm bombing in one area of my life, I'm bombing. But you got to stand against the wiles of the devil. you got to stand and make the stand. Because he's going to tell you all the time, you're not any good. You're no good here. You're no good there. You're failing here, and so God doesn't want you anymore. That's not true. That's not true. Right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I stand on that. We have to stand on it every day. You have to. This is for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against dark, or against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So there's a whole other realm around us. A realm where there's warfare going on. Where fallen angels and good angels are doing battle. Where the fallen angels come to attack us. And this is not a, a, a call to battle. We're already in it. It's already there. Whether you've recognized it before this moment or not, doesn't matter. It's already there. The battle has been raging. It began when, the, when, when Satan said, I will be like the Most High, and God said, no. And a third of the angels went with him. And I think Paul sets here, and we don't, you know, again, my background and, and some of my Pentecostal brothers and sisters will say, you know, start with, you know, you have demons of this and demons of that, and you have demons that are over cities and demons that are over counties and demons that are over states and demons that are over, you know, stop. Stop it. There, there, there does seem, and there's some argument for that in, in the book of Daniel, that there are some who have some influence over government systems. Right? Daniel started praying and fasting. The day he started, Gabriel was dispatched to go and speak to him. Came against the prince of Persia. The force that had the influence over Persia. Or in Persia. And he told him, I, I came up, I came against this, and Michael the archangel, the angel of your people, the archangel, the only archangel, came and, and, and took him on and I, so I could get through. And when I'm done with you, I'm going back to face the Prince of Greece. And that world power wasn't coming into play for another 200 years. There are places where I feel like the enemy has a pretty good foothold. Certainly. You know, when, when we came back and, and went to Greenville to start a church up in Greenville, it was impossible. We just could not break through anywhere with anything to, to teach the Bible verse by verse. You couldn't do it. I left. Some people were discouraged that I left. Other pastors, what are you doing? You're leaving. Well, I'm going down. I'm going to work with Roger and Kalamazoo. This is what God wants. We're adopting the boys. We need to get them out of this area anyways. Blah, 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 blah. I have all my reasons. All the reasons, all fleshly reasons in that, you know, we adopted the boys. We need to get them out of the area. And in good, spiritual, I believe this is what God wanted. This was my measuring stick. God, when, when there is not one single person left, then I'll know you're ready for me to go. And one day, the last person that was coming to meet with us in our, in our home called and said they weren't coming anymore. 
You know what, man? Shake the dust off and carry on. So another friend of mine who came back to be a pastor too decided he was going to go up and give it a try because, you know, I don't know if they thought that I didn't or what, but within six months, he's like, man, this is crazy up here what this is like. So I know. I was there for six years, dude. You've only been there six months. Hang on. We don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. This is the other reason why you perform the way you should with your bosses, with your, your coworkers out in the community, as to the Lord. Is the influence in their life is the same accuser you have in your life. Satan accuses them. But listen, they don't. You don't have a demon of alcoholism. You don't have a demon of drug addiction. You don't have a demon of this and demon. You don't. The Bible always describes those as works of the flesh. They never describe them or attribute them to Satan or anybody else. They're work of the flesh. That is man's heart. You need to remember that too. The wickedness here, the spiritual wickedness, or host of, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, they are wicked. But what is the, how does the Bible describe the heart of man? Wicked above everything else. You understand that? We have, the, we have the potential all on our own to be more wicked than Satan. The proof of that will be the millennial reign. He's going to be locked up in the pit for a thousand years. And still, with Jesus himself on the earth, his kingdom, his rule... And sin will still happen. It'll still happen. And when you let Satan out, one more fight, one more war, which we don't even get described to us. This is just put down, period. That's it. This is our own wickedness has brought us here. But as the church, it's changed people. Our enemy, our enemy is Satan. Our, en our enemy is the, the spiritual wickedness because they influence the world systems. They do influence people. But those people outside these walls, those are our mission. They're not our enemy. Those individuals out there are our mission. The world system is an enemy, our own flesh is an enemy. And Satan is an enemy, but those people out there are our mission. To break through the strongholds that are set up by the enemy to get to them. To bring the light of the gospel to them. To hopefully set free more people in the name of Jesus. They are our mission. They're not our enemy. They may set themselves up to be our enemy. Certainly they have wicked hearts too. They may embrace the mission of the enemy. But then they just become a part of that system then, don't they? And they'll lose. We need to make sure we have clear defined enemies that we recognize. And the first one we better recognize is the one we see in the mirror looking back at us. Before we worry about anybody else outside those walls being our enemy. The way we think, the way we act, the way we conduct ourselves. Are we listening to the world system? Are we getting sucked into all this? And probably the ones who know, you know I don't want to single anybody out here, but the ones who know more how hard it is to not get sucked in are those of us who have been in the military. Because we see an enemy, we see a physical enemy. We have to remember it's a spiritual enemy.
Remember, the church is also organized. We've already talked about that, right? He, he talked about gifts that are given in the church to be teachers and pastors and elders and whatever and, and, and give direction and keep order within the church. We have our own order and we have our orders. Now he's describing our enemy to us. And the enemy is ordered. He's not in chaos. It's not against himself. And that was the accusation against Jesus, that he was casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. And he said, wait a minute, what good would that do me? A house divided can't stand. Satan can't stand if he's divided against himself and casting himself out. He can't, it, you know, it's not going to work that way. It's not how it works. They are orderly. They are ready. And they will influence the world. But we have a greater influence in us. Right? Greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. Greater is he who lives in me than anything else in this world. Man, demon, doesn't matter. The one who lives in me, who has taken up residence in me, is stronger than all. Listen, when Satan does get locked in that pit, how many angels got to throw him in there? Right? One. Not even Michael. Not even Gabriel. Just an angel. And not to, you know, diminish them because they're pretty bad dudes. And they're ready to go to war. Yeah. I want to be like Elisha. I want to, on those days when I'm having my doubts, when I'm, when I'm shaking and my faith is, is shaking a little bit, I want to be able to look up and see that I'm surrounded by the armies of heaven and that whatever's coming for me has no power over me. Yeah. Read Job. I dare you to read the whole book of Job. My goodness, it's a long book. But there are some really cool parts in there. We see in the beginning, Satan coming back and forth to answer to God for what he's doing. And God keeps offering up Job. And even Job sometimes, we see his words where he's kind of, man, he's getting rocked. He just does not understand what's going on. And his friends are not really friends, he's finding out. And, you know, but it gets to the end of the book. And it says, and all this Job didn't sin. In all of that, Job didn't sin. That's who I want to be. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having gird your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What's the emphasis here? Is it the armor? No. No. It's standing, refusing to give ground. It's refusing to give ground. We, we don't compromise with the world systems and their beliefs, the people, demonic, we don't. We do not give ground. Don't give ground in your own life. If you have convictions, you understand the conviction of God's word, you understand his will in your life, then don't give ground to the enemy in your life. Don't entertain the thoughts that you have gotten rid of, that you've brought under, under control. Don't go back to that. Don't give ground. And don't just take up a little bit of the armor. You take up all the armor. The whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. In the evil day. We're going to talk about this tonight. we got church tonight. We're going to talk about this stuff tonight. We're in an evil day right now. So what is our responsibility? And I want to talk about it for a little bit. Because most of the night's going to be given to prayer. And you look to the end of this. If I don't get to the end of this, 
you'll see why it's going to be given to prayer. We'll read through this. I may not teach all the way through this today, but maybe I'll finish it up tonight, maybe next week. But The whole armor of God, that you may be, able, may be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all to stand, stand, therefore, having gird your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your, your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to uh, quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god now you see the armor split into two things the armor to have right you, you gird your you gird your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness having shod your feet with the preparation of gospel peace these are things that you would put on that you would wear and then you have the things that will be taken the things you have to pick up and carry with you And so you have the truth. And, and, and it's just to gird, up, gird your waist with truth. So it's like a belt is what he's talking about. You know, and we have this idea in our head that all the Roman soldiers had them little skirt things on that they wore. And not everybody had that. Not everybody fought that way. Most people wore a long cloak kind of thing, toga, whatever you want to call it. To fight, you would have to gather that up and you would have to cinch it up in your belt so your legs were free to fight so you didn't get wrapped up in your, in your clothes, in your skirt, yeah, in your long skirt. Okay. Gird your waist with truth. You know the truth. And this would be something that would be around your abdomen. So if it placed any value of protection it was right around your waist right around your abdomen around your hips maybe it would protect your hips the things that keep you moving forward some of your vitals and having put on the breastplate of righteousness another thing you're going to wear you're going to put it on it's going to cover your heart it's going to cover your lungs it's going to cover the rest of anything else your belt wasn't covering it's going to cover that the breastplate of righteousness and we've known We've seen in this, in this book, he's talked about righteousness. And it's a matter of the heart, right? Children, obey your parents because it's right. We do these things because they're right. Because it's righteous. We have changed. Our hearts have been changed. It's become righteousness. Put on righteousness. Walk in the right ways. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Are you studying? Do you study God's word? Are you pulling it up? Are you looking at it every day? The gospel of peace. Can you share? Can you witness with anybody? If you walk out there and you're walking in righteousness and you have the truth, can you share that with somebody? Do you know how? Do you know how to tell people what's changed your life? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to walk in that direction? Above all, these three things are above everything else. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench out the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, this isn't the little round shield that you would see some of the Roman soldiers in the pictures have. This was a long shield. They could pick up and it would cover his whole body because one of the things they would do is they'd light arrows on fire and they'd shoot them at somebody. And these guys could form a wall. The ones in the front put those shields down in front, get down behind the wall, and the ones in the back would put those shields up over the top and it was a wall. It would keep the fire, those, those darts from being able to get in and my understanding also is that it was leather and they could they could soak them down so when those fiery darts hit they went out why would you shoot fiery darts at everybody wouldn't it freak you out if you're standing there and your partner there gets taken out by a dart but not just a uh, an arrow but it's on fire but not only that not only would it take you out if it hit you 
It would also cause a, uh, an awful lot of chaos because everything around you would begin to catch on fire. Whatever your cover was, whether it's brush, trees, whatever it was, fire would start, smoke would be up, complete confusion, breaks down communication. Because when you're rocked, when you feel like you are being targeted by the enemy, you shouldn't be going it alone. You need to get your faith, get in your church, Sunday morning, Bible study, prayer time, whatever it is, get in here and get with the other believers and let's get the wall up around them. It's how we protect each other. This is our job to be a unit, to not just be a bunch of individuals, but to be a unit that watches out and protects for each other. And that's what faith does. I can tell you how many times some of your faith is what builds me up because even up here, I'm not a man of great faith all the time. And I can get caught up and drugged down because I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking the fiery arrows. And I'm not holding my shield up very well. And I need you to bit, get there beside me and stick your shield beside mine and stand our ground. The helmet of salvation. And we went over this at great length in the first couple of chapters. You, you are saved. He chose you. He called you. He made your salvation sure. He knew you before the foundations of the world. Before he said, let there be light. He knew me. And there was nothing to stop me from hearing his call. From hearing his gospel. So that he knew on the day that I would accept that it was loud and clear in my ears and, I, and I, I had the opportunity and I did it. And he knew I would. And I can't take that helmet off. That helmet reminds me that I belong to him. No matter what, I belong to him. No matter what tragedy is going on, doesn't matter what's going on in this world, how crazy it gets, doesn't matter what loss, doesn't matter what gain. I belong to Him. It is the knowledge I have that I belong to Him. It is in my head, not just in my heart. It is in my head that God is real. The God I worship is the God who created everything. It is not just in my heart. It is in my head. Listen, it's the same thing that happens. I was talking earlier about the basic training. That The military does the same thing to you. They, they give you a cause. The cause, the constitution, the people, the nation, the defense of everybody. There's your cause that gets in your heart. And they stick in your head. How to do it. Who you are. You are. Wherever you go in this world, you are the United States. You are the representative. Listen, wherever you go, you are the believer in Jesus Christ. You are the church. And we are to live and to act like it, like we know we're supposed to. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And this word sword is not talking about a big broad sword, the big battle sword. This is talking about the short dagger-like sword for hand-to-hand -hand combat, close combat. This is why it's important to memorize God's Word. So that you have His answer in your head in your heart, but in your head, so that when somebody asks you a question, you don't got to say, well, you know what, I'll bring my Bible tomorrow. So that you know, 
This is what God's Word says. Don't believe me? Go home and look it up. Don't believe me? Here's a Bible. I don't got time right now. We don't have time. We're on the clock. We can't do this. But listen, this is what God's Word says. Maybe someday it'll be standing in front of physical accusers. And our response will be, this is what God's word says. Why won't you perform a same-sex marriage? Uh, you know, it's my constitutional right not to. Freedom of religion. That's all well and good, but that's man's answer. My answer because the Bible says it's not supposed to be. Because the Bible says it's an abomination before God to live that life. And they need to know the truth. Because it doesn't honor God. It's against God. It's against His will. And it's not, they are not getting what God has for them if they go and they live this lifestyle. I hurt them if I don't tell them the truth. But you want me to go ahead and do what is against God's word? I won't do it. Well, you, you know, it's just the Bible, blah, 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 blah. I'm not getting it constitutionally right. Well, you know what? If I have a lawyer, he can argue constitutional right. This is God's word. This is my marching order. This is my direction. This is my instruction in life. You can't say abortion is murder. Yeah, I can because it says so right here. The Bible also says any country that participates in that kind of stuff is in a world of hurt as far as God's concerned. You know? What do you want me to do? Hey, let me give you a little bit of history. Every world power that has embraced killing the children and homosexuality has died shortly after at least become ineffective. And now what? You're going to prove it wrong? See, I had that argument with my dad one day. Right? Well, just because it didn't work for you doesn't mean it won't work for me. Eh, guess who was right? You know what I'm saying? Uh, anyways, we know. We know in our head. We know in our heart. We've covered our hearts. We've got our shield of faith. We've got our helmet of salvation. We've got the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We've got our weapons. Praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all uh, perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And to pray always. Paul is saying in another letter, pray without ceasing. Always in a mindset of prayer. Always an open line of communication between us and God. Always. 24-7. Ready to hear, ready to speak. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. In the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Asking in the Spirit. Why? Because then you ask rightly. Then you pray for the right things. It's not just wants and desires and it's, it's needs. It's for God's will to be done. Look through the Gospels. The apostles never asked Jesus, teach us how to preach. Teach us how to perform miracles. Teach us how to cast out demons. They asked him, teach us how to pray. None of the other stuff matters. Because if you're not in communication with God Almighty, then it's not for Him if you do the rest of those things. That's why there will be people on that day that say, in your name, we cast out demons, we did this, we did that. And He's going to say, I don't know who you are. doesn't say it never happened. I just don't know you. You never communicated with me. You never talked to me. You never asked my will. And again, you got these faith teachers that will say, if you ask, end your prayer with, your will be done, or Lord willing. That's a show of a lack of faith. No, it's not. It's exactly how he taught us to pray. 
Your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Period. That's it. In the garden, he says, Lord, Father, if, if this cup can pass from me, then let it pass. But not my will, but your will be done. Lack of faith? You going to tell me Jesus died on the cross because of a lack of faith? That's where that argument has to go, isn't it? It's not a lack of faith. It's a great act of trust to put your life, your wants, your needs, your desires into the hand of God and say, I will take what you give me because you know better. I will wait on you to answer me. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance. How many people prayed, actually, actually prayed for the people in San Bernardino? I don't want to see no hands, but think about that. You actually prayed. Did you see all the, all the accusations of these Horrible people, all you ever do is pray. You don't ever do anything. And it wasn't one person. That was rampant the next day. Some of them are the same people that were putting out posts saying, oh, we're, our thoughts and prayers are with the people in Paris. But when it happens here, then it's, oh, God isn't fixing anything. One of the papers or magazines ran that as their cover page. God's not fixing anything. Wow. We're in trouble. And we better be praying for the saints. All the saints. And for me, Paul says, that utterance may be given to me and that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So not just for each other. We all certainly, you guys are to come around each other. He says that was the very first thing. With all perseverance, never stop. Never stop praying, and, and especially not for each other. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may, be, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He's going before Caesar. And if you read Acts, you track him through the first parts of his trials and who he speaks to, and Festus and, and all those guys, and, and Herod. And, and he's going before Caesar. Man, pray for me. And, and everybody else that I come in contact with. That when I open my mouth, it's God's word. You guys pray for me. I don't, I don't have any inclination that that'll be true for me, but it could be one day that your pastor has to stand in front of people that aren't his normal congregation and have to speak the gospel. Hey, listen, even if it's not on a grand scale, these guys in the band, Jack, asked me a long time ago when it was started. You come with us so that you can do this. We're going to do this the old style. We're going to have a break. We're going to present the gospel. We're going to give people, give people an opportunity to get saved. So pray for me. Pray for them. Because if I can't show up at one of the events, then that means that they have to do it. You know? It, it's going to come on big scales and small scales. This is for which I'm an ambassador in chains. And the ambassadors in their day would wear big gold chains to show the affluence and the, the, the uh, well, word, I just lost my word. Anyways, show their position and show the affluence of their, of their governments and the representation of their governments, their wealth and their prosperity. So they wear these big gold chains when they would go and meet with other dignitaries of other countries. And Paul's saying here, I'm an ambassador in chains. These are my chains, though. They're, they're around his wrist. He's, he's chained to this guard. 
But I've got my chains that make me an ambassador, just like those gold chains. And in his opinion, this is better than any gold chain wearing ambassador that could walk free. I am chained. Rome is chained to me. I'm God's ambassador to Rome. That it may be that I, that that in it I may be able to speak boldly as I ought to speak. But that you also know, or that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing, Tychicus, uh, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you. And so Paul has his letter to build everybody up, to get them organized, to get them in the mindset of who they belong to, who they are in Christ, what the church is to be like, that they are are are. They're, they have an enemy that is coming at them and coming after them through world systems, but also supernaturally. I mean, let's face it, the demonic doesn't just happen in, the, in even the angelic realm. It doesn't just happen through other people or through world systems. It's flat out spiritual assault on us too. I've talked to enough people who have seen things that... You know, it freaks them out. And I'll tell you what, to see a vision even, and I've had that, it will, it could very well freak you out <laughs> just because it's not normal. But Tychik is a beloved brother has come to let you know everything else about me. So this letter is not about me, Paul's saying. This letter is about you to build you up. Anything you want to know about me, Tychicus, you just, he's my friend, he's my brother, he's going to tell you everything else, my needs, how things are going for me, my health, all that, he's going to take care of that. This man carried this letter to this church. He said, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts, because they know, right, Paul's chained up in Rome, he's not likely to come out. Likely their leader, the one who founded the church, the one who spent more time with them than he did any place else, is likely going to die soon. Peace to the brethren, love and with faith from, the, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all, those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. You see Paul speaking for God. He's blessing the church in the name of God. He can speak for Jesus. This is what God is coming for. This is my hope. This is what God wants for you. Peace. And love with faith. This is what he wants for you in your day of persecution. In the place where people hate you. Peace from God. Love and faith. All from God. And grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. So we got to have that attitude toward each other. We got to have that attitude toward our, our, our friends, our Christian brothers and sisters, to speak those kind of words to each other, to remember. Grace and peace to you. Let's leave it with that right now. Lord, we just thank you again for your instruction Lord, how to operate in the physical realm and our relationships with everybody else, with our, our spouses, with our kids, with our co-workers, with our communities. And how to operate and function in the spirit with and against the spiritual realm.
where Satan made himself very real, very clearly the real enemy of our souls and that he caused confusion in the garden with Eve and Adam. And he's continued. Now he raised himself up against you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to, rem- to, to know, to understand when truly is an attack from the devil and when it is our own flesh that we're dealing with. Lord, help us to honor you in all things. Give us the wisdom. Give us the understanding. Tell us plainly what your will is for each of our lives individually. We know it's to honor you. Show us the best way to do that in our circumstances. Lord, we do pray for those who fell this week in California to an enemy that has set itself against a nation that is driven and influenced by the great enemy. To be against the people that are trying to hang on to your name on our buildings, on our money. in our lives. Lord, they have made no bones about that they have declared war on you and on your church and on your people Israel. So we pray for the families and and friends of those who lost loved ones in this attack and in Paris and in Beirut and in Africa, where it has become a daily thing. And it is a heavy thing. Lord, I pray that it stays heavy, that it does not become something that is, we are desensitized to and is not a big deal, but that every attack weighs on us. The Lord, even the, those who carried out the attack, they are lost forever. And I pray that that would break our hearts. So Lord, again, I ask that you would build us up and show us how to be a light in this dark world. How to reach out to these people. How to stand our ground the ground that you've given us in our lives and in our communities. In Jesus' name, amen.